I know you seem in some respects a little out of the game. But you're not out of the game. You can fight. You can fight here in California, and you can get involved and fight because of the wonders of technology in all the places around the country. I'm going to be debating tomorrow night a bunch of very good people. I happen to believe I'm the best person to win this election. <laughs> I also happen to believe I'm also the best person to be successful in getting the kind of bills passed in Washington to turn this country around. Oh, come on. And so let me just very quickly lay out why I believe that. We've got very serious problems with our economy. The biggest problem is the economy is not growing. If, if we, if we and, and by the way, that leads to the biggest problem with respect to our deficit. The deficit is as big as it is in large part because the economy is so sick. Mm -hmm. Government payments are up, government revenues are down. If we can get this economy humming again, we won't solve the entire deficit problem, but we will bring it back into a range where it's actually solvable. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Well, I've got a strong pro-growth platform, but let me tell you about one aspect of it, because I think this is the most important and will have the biggest impact. When I was growing up, I grew up in a little steel town outside of Pittsburgh, in western Pennsylvania. And so when I was there. growing up, 21% of the workforce was involved in manufacturing. Today, it's nine. People want to know where the middle of America went. It went to Mexico and China, Malaysia, etc. How are we going to get those jobs back? People say they'll never come back. Look, I don't know if any of you are manufacturing. I've talked to a lot of manufacturers. I haven't found one who wanted to move their shop offshore. Not one. They would have loved to be able to stay here, but they couldn't. Why? Taxes. Regulation, taxation, litigation. Those are the three reasons. People say, oh, it was low. oh, you hear the media say, oh, it's because big business didn't want to pay labor rates. They'd be happy to pay labor rates if they could be profitable. It's not labor. As you all know, if you've ever been in a manufacturing plant, you know what you see a lot of? Machines, not people. Still a lot of people, but you see a lot more machines and people having to run those machines. It's not people that's driving manufacturers, people cost driving manufacturers, other than the regulation the government puts on with respect to hiring people. So look at the three things we can do. Taxation. What I've suggested is that we need to take the corporate tax rate, which is the second highest in the industrial world, and cut it from 35% to zero. Yeah. Yeah. process in America and you set your employment up here, you will pay no corporate taxes. In addition, there's a problem. It's called Dodd-Frank yeah. and it's called government uh, banking regulations under Obama. Yes. You cannot borrow money in America today. There are <laughs> banks, you probably saw this, there are banks in New York who are actually charging depositors for their deposits mm -hmm. yeah. because they have no place to invest the money because they can't because of the regulators. So what, so okay, we cut the corporate tax to zero, where are they going to get the money to invest in new plant and equipment? Well, manufacturers over the past, I think now, let me see, seven or eight years, if you were a manufacturer in China, and you made products there, you sold them, you made a profit, you paid taxes in China, and now you have profits, what does a company do with those profits? They sit there, why? Because to bring them back under the current law, you have to pay a 35% tax after you've already paid tax to the other countries. We are the only country in the world that does that. And so guess what happens? $1.2 trillion is sitting in countries all over the world. So let's do this. In combination with cutting the corporate tax to zero for manufacturers, let's say to manufacturers, you bring that money back, we'll charge you five, not 35 if you invest that money in plant and equipment. Now we've got it, the, the, the profit margin and the capital to rebuild American manufacturing in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 
throw on top of that regulatory reform, and I can go down a lot from EPA to NLRB. I was in Charleston two days ago, Charleston, South Carolina, and Hilda Solis does this article in the Charleston paper talking about how manufacturing is coming back and bragged about the fact that in Charleston, there's a 4.3% increase with almost 1,000 new jobs. She didn't mention that those 1,000 new jobs were at a Boeing plant in Charleston that just started in June that they are trying to shut down. <laughs> Why? Because they moved from a union state to a non-union state. You would think they would just be happy with any job created in America, but no. Why? Power. And right. Goes back. Power and control. There's one word you have to understand, and I think you all know that because you are surrounded with it here in California. If you want to understand the left, you have to understand one word: power. It is all about power. It is all about them knowing better than you. So that's how we get our economy going. What are we going to do about, and by the way, I have a track record, 16 years in the, in the House and Senate, never voted for a tax increase. Voted for every tax yeah. increase. That is not the case with other Republicans in this race, particularly the two who get all the attention. One supported, one opposed the Bush tax cuts, and the other one increased taxes in his own state. I don't have a record of any of those things. Second big thing, entitlements. Uh -huh. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, those three programs, 40% of the federal budget. Okay. And growing. There's 72 entitlement programs, ladies and gentlemen. What's an entitlement program? Anybody define an entitlement program for me? Sorry. Take from me and give to you. Okay, well, that's one way to define it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't argue with that, but that's one way to define it. Give me programs. <laughs> the entitlement program is one that provides uh, income to people who don't pay into the system anymore. No. no. Or who don't produce that. That's not, that, that's not an entitlement program. It's very important to understand because some people are like, oh, don't talk about Social Security. It's not an entitlement program. You earned it. No, that's it. Social Security is an entitlement program. Yeah. Social Security is an entitlement program. Yeah, it is. Medicare is an entitlement Whether you paid into it or not doesn't really matter as far as whether it's an entitlement program. What an entitlement program is... Buying <laughs> I feel like Mitt Romney at the yeah. Iowa State Fair. <laughs> <laughs> entitlement program. Entitlement program is a provision in law that says if you meet certain requirements of the law, you are entitled to the benefit. Yeah. Thus, an entitlement program. So if you paid into Social Security X number of quarters, 10 quarters, and you reached a certain, met a certain age of eligibility, you are legally entitled to the money. That's what makes it an entitlement program. All right? So we have 72 programs that either by age or by income or by payments or whatever, people are entitled to money from the federal government. All of those programs, oh, I shouldn't sell. Most of those programs, certainly the vast majority of the money that comprises those programs, are uncapped entitlement programs. So, all right, how many people could, anybody here tell me how much we're going to spend this year on Medicare? Raise your hand. Anybody know? You're wrong. Anybody else? You're wrong. Okay. Anybody else? You're wrong too. Why? Because nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> Okay? You can't know. Why can't you know? It's an uncapped entitlement. Whatever seniors consume.